if you're a cattleman, you're feeding people in some way, shape or form, whether it be you're just selling cattle at a sale barn or selling them direct, we're losing our older generation of ranchers. And if they don't have somebody to come in and to take that over, it's going to be gone. And who's going to buy it is Bill Gates is one of the largest landowners now in the state of Nebraska. And people don't know that it's Bill Gates buying it. It's not that they're selling it to him. It's these big businesses coming in, hiding behind a name, and they're just gobbling up these small ranches when they decide to retire. Beef's not the problem. It's the bun, right? There's days where I think we're making headway and there's days where I just can't believe that people are trying to have people push crickets. I see my dad try to do CPR for a minute. They just don't understand the lengths that we go to to try to do the best that we can. All right. Good morning. We have with us Michaela Mann. Welcome, Michaela. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. I'll tell you a little funny. I saw in my schedule and it, it just showed up and I didn't see the A. It just said like Michael Mann. And I was like, that's interesting because Michael Mann is a sort of a famous climate sci- scientist. And I thought I was going to be having a very different discussion this morning. But it, it, so I, I, Not I, me. I, yeah, so I was going to say, so this will be a bit of a different discussion. So it would actually be interesting to get him on here to talk about some stuff because he's a very... I guess, extremely pro climate change. We need to do everything in the you know, type of thing, I think, but it would be interesting to talk to him. But anyway, let me just get a little bit about your background. I understand you, you are into the ranching side of things. And so maybe you can share with us your background. Yes. My name is Michaela. I'm a rancher from Eastern Nebraska. I grew up on our family ranch. We raise registered Red Angus and Angus cattle so other ranchers buy our bulls to breed their cows were what you would call a seed stock operation. Grew up heavily involved in that. I went to college at South Dakota State University where I got my degree in animal science. After college, I went and worked for a contract research facility for 11 years whilst still helping out on our family ranch. In the mean, towards the end of that little career, I started my own business and then started sharing about ranching, what we do and why we do it on social media at events, as well as started my own business. Where is South Dakota State? What city is that? In? That's Brookings, South Dakota. Brookings. Okay. I don't, I've been a rapid city and I, I, that's about it. So I saw that's that. We're the other side of South Dakota. You're on is the other Brookings. side. Okay. Yeah, so that's you're, complete other side. <laughs> so you're way on the east, east side. Because period, the capital's somewhere that side of the state too. I've never been there. Yes. Yeah. Yep. It's, I live about an hour north of Omaha. So for me to go to college, it was like a three hour shot straight north. So it's just right on the edge of South Dakota because we're it. Brookings. South Dakota. And, and so you said you raise seed stock. So you basically, you guys are raising bulls and then those bulls are being shipped off to other ranches so that they can help their genetic program. Is that kind of what's yes, going on? Yes, correct. We like artificially inseminate. All of our cattle are registered when I tell people that who don't understand genetics and what we're doing, which is fine. I'm like the amount of record keeping we're keeping, for example, I could tell you your stakes, great grandpa's birth weight. Like it's all there. That's how much detail and record keeping we're doing because ranchers want that information because it helps them market and sell their livestock at whether it be to other ranchers for breeding or maybe they're finishing out their own cattle at a feedlot and they'll know that they're going to grade on the grid, have, high marbling yielding cattle. It's all a lot of a numbers game of you're paying attention to all that information. Yeah. And you, when you went, to, you got your degree in animal science, was there like, I, I assume there's specialties and you can maybe focus on one area versus another. Were you focusing on specific can, can, cattle genetics or was there some other aspect that you focused on? Animal science actually is interesting. The animal science degree is actually pre-vet besides all the science as in your chemistry and your biology and such. So I literally did everything from I harvested steers in my meat science class. We literally harvested steers to repro where we were looking at the reproductive tract of animals and studying all of that as well. So you literally get a taste for everything in regards to animal agriculture. I focus more on the beef production side, but you're really actually very well-rounded nutrition as well with livestock. You get a little taste of everything. Now you, so on your ranch, I I know you said you raise bulls and bulls typically aren't they usually don't turn into hamburger that often, or they don't, they're not usually something people like to eat because they're tough. And the, the, you prefer right. steers and heifers and things and whatnot for the meat production. Let me, so you guys, are you guys raising beef cattle as well? Do you have a, a program of that yes. as well? You're, you're feeding people as well, correct? 
Yes. So every, if you're a cattleman, you're feeding people in some way, shape or form, whether it be you're just selling cattle at a sale barn or selling them direct. A lot of ranchers use, there's a lot of websites online where you can record like a pen of heifers that maybe a feedlot will buy, or if you're trying to sell them as breeding stock, for example. To your point though, every animal we raise will eventually turn into some sort of food or byproduct. My father just took a group of animals to be sold at the sale barn. And one of them was an older bull that he served his purpose. He did a great job, but it we were done with him and it was time to move on. So he'll get sold. They call them cow kill plants. They buy older animals. And depending on the age and quality of that animal may turn into your dog's dog food. Uh, byproducts will be used for the multiple things humans need from medicine to textiles. Or if it's an okay animal, it might be your next McDonald's burger. Like they are still used, but the younger animals that we consume, we do grow those. Yes, your steers, which are castrated males and heifers that aren't good enough quality to be kept as breeding stock. That's the group. They're still phenomenal animals. They just don't have those maternal characteristics that we're looking for in females. Those enter into either our branded beef program or we'll sell direct to somebody else. Yeah, for, yeah. let me just give you a moment here because you said your branded beef program. What is the name of your, like if somebody's like, hey, I, want, I just want to get some beef from you guys. What's the name of your company, by the way? Our company is D and D Beef. Our ranch is D and D Cattle Company. It was started by my dad, Dan and Dwayne before I was a thought. So I wanted to pay homage to them because I am, it's our genetics that I'm feeding out and using in our program. So I did D and D Beef to Pay respects to my dad and grandpa who started our family ranch. Okay. d and beef. I think I might've had some years, if I'm not mistaken, but let me ask you, so artificial insemination, why do we do that? Why not do it the old fashioned way and let the bulls just have their way with the heifers? And what is the advantage of artificial insemination? Because a lot of people are critical, particularly animal rights advocates. They, they liken it to you're raping the cows or something like that. What is the deal with artificial insemination? Why is it used so much? So in regards to the artificial insemination, when you look at beef production versus dairy production, primarily use artificial insemination. The reasoning why is they're breeding cattle year round for milk production. Um, and also dairy bulls are extremely dangerous. There is a, it's pretty commonly known in the ag community, uh, dairy bulls, because they're not, um, they're just are very aggressive. So a lot of dairy cattlemen will do artificial insemination. Now in regards to beef production, a lot of the people, beef producers that do artificial insemination are seed stock producers like us. And then if you have like a commercial cattleman, so that's somebody that's just raising cattle, they have cows and they sell all their calves every spring. So they're just selling them to maybe a feedlot or a stocker operation to enter into our food supply. They don't artificially inseminate as much. One of the benefits of artificial insemination is when you're breeding soon to be first time moms, you choose a low birth weight bull. You want them to have an easy, they're still growing, right? You want to make sure that they're going to have an easy birth that's easy on the cow and the calf. So one example is using artificial insemination to breed those heifers out of a proven herd sire is what it's called. You get these bull sale catalogs or bull semen catalogs, and you can see that this bull has been used for years. He's very accurate in having easy calving calves, that's what you want for a first time heifer, right? When you're calving hundreds of heifers, you don't want to have to worry about huge calves. You'll have a wreck. You'll have to be calling the vet and have C-sections and it can turn into a nightmare. So that's just one example of why artificial insemination is good, as well as just bringing in some superior genetics that you can introduce into your herd as well. Yeah. With regard to like just the safety and I don't know, and, and I, I suppose you probably have, a, I'm sure you have a better handle on this than I, in cows that are bred in the wild, if, if such a thing exists, I know there are some wild cows out there. I think I heard some down like in <clears throat> Southern New Mexico and other places they have wild cows running around still, but when they, how, what percentage, what is the infant mortality rate of, of cows that are not under domestic care versus what you might produce? Do you know the, do you know what those numbers might be? No, I don't. And that's something that I think if you were going to look at like statistically, statistically, just to see it actually look like at bison or something, because that's what we have in our country to get an example that I'm not sure, but we'll have years, we'll have no death loss, we'll have 110% um, success in calving rate. And that's because we've got some twins and stuff that we're keeping an eye on. And then, you know, there's some years where you'll lose 
I don't know what the industry average is just for beef production in general, but a lot of times when you do have death loss in beef production, it's because a calf's backwards, upside down, twins that both get stuck in the birth canal, nature happens. But when you choose good bulls to help make sure that they have an easy birth, and for example, that's why some producers will use artificial insemination, we want them to have a good birth because it benefits not only us, but of course the cow in that calf that they get literally off on the right foot. Yeah. My understanding, I think, I think the industry average is something like 98 plus percentage of, of calves actually not only are born, but they actually even make it into adulthood. They don't yeah. die early. Like in the wild, it's interesting. University of Pennsylvania put out a neat study a few years ago, looking at white tailed deer in the wild and what their fate was. And something like 58% of them did not make it to 32 weeks. They were they were eaten or died of starvation or disease or something like that. So the, the beef industry and, and the dairy industry has a much, much better, higher success rate than that. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I understand that with artificial insemination, and this is probably particularly germane to the dairy industry, I guess the beef industry as well, perhaps, you can sex the animals and you can predetermine what sex you want. So as if you're a dairy operation, you're going to probably preferentially want heifers rather than, than males. And so is that a fair statement? Yeah, that's true. It's in the industry, but it's not as common for beef producers yet. One of the reasonings is, is it's the volume of, I just think the volume is not there where as many sires is what we call them, sires, bull sires. It's not as common when you look at those catalogs and you're looking to shop, there is some that has sex semen, but it just hasn't, it hasn't swept through yet is what I'm trying to say. I think it is more common in dairy, but not necessarily in beef production yet. Yeah. I, like I said, dairy, I think is the reason makes more sense to me, certainly. Yeah. Because people are saying, what are you going to do with a male dairy cow? You, well, you turn it into veal or you, you know, I don't know, turn it into hamburger eventually, probably, or something like that. You know, as far as, and, and I guess there's the other thing you mentioned about selecting for easier births, but I guess also there's something called bullying injuries. I've, I've, correct if I'm wrong on that term, where they, when they're actually mating and the bull jumps on the back of the cow and hurts her, basically. Is that something that happens on a... <laughs> Yeah, it's actually, that actually doesn't been too much, but um, in feedlot settings, and maybe this is the term you're thinking of, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but in, sometimes in feedlot settings, they'll get bowlers. And that's just where it could be that maybe a castration wasn't completed the best. As you can understand, there's a lot that goes into that when they're castrating a calf. Maybe there's an undescended testicle or something. Sometimes that happens. And that one steer in the pen just continues to stay a little more aggressive. And then they'll just keep riding. And then that's when injuries can happen. And a lot of times what they'll do is try to separate that animal out just to have that not happen. In regards to bulls, we don't really have too many injuries. Actually, what will happen is it'll be if you have multiple bulls in a pasture, the bulls will actually start fighting when they're trying to breed a cow. And it's actually you know, it's two guys flexing. They just get in a fight because they want to be with that cow that day. And they end up usually actually injuring each other more than so than a female, usually. Yeah. So with regard to AI or, or genetic selection, what do, you know, I mean, uh, there was obviously like you, you mentioned selecting for animals that are going to marble out nicer. And a lot of people prefer some of the higher grading out animals, whether it's choice or USDA prime. What other th considerations are being looked at? Are there like new trends where we're looking? I know some people talk about we want animals that are adapted to perhaps sustainability type features and things like that. What What is the, like the latest push with regard to cattle genetics these days? That's debatable and depends on region, as you can imagine. If you drive across the country and you look at cattle, for example, the further out west you get, some people will say those cows look a little more rangy. And what that means is they just look a little more sturdy. They might not be as flush as meaning they have as much condition on them. So it depends on region. But in regards to efficiency, there's so many traits that you look for. So it's average daily gain, feed efficiency, and those are all genetics traits that ranchers are looking at. You can look at the ribeye area of this bull. I don't want to breed this bull because he has a smaller ribeye area. You want a bigger ribeye area, obviously, because that means he's going to yield and grade better. But then you also look at feed efficiency as well in those EPDs. Uh, milk is actually another EPD that you look at. So it's not all the bull. A lot of it's the cow too. If you have a cow that is a heavy milker, that might mean that she's eating too much food and kind of, you want a, a in-between line when it comes to maternal characteristics too, right? You want her to be the most efficient as well. So these are all traits that ranchers, it's just this constant balancing act that we're trying to do. 
I wouldn't say that there's necessarily a new trait that is being talked about, but it's always ranchers. If you start talking EPDs, like that conversation could go on for five hours because we're always trying to be the most efficient, pay attention to all these traits and find the most well-balanced animal in regards to feed efficiency, meaning they have a good feed to gain ratio, consuming what they need, but not over consuming and actually putting that feed to good use to make that good looking steak that we all want. Yeah. What is, as far as feed efficiency, because you hear about like chickens and pigs and cows, and I, I keep, I say it takes X amount of pounds of feed to convert to meat. Has that feed efficiency over the years? Because I, I, I saw some, I, t- I think I see FAO data from a few years ago, and it was lower than what I had previously thought. What is like current feed efficiency, if you can describe so that? So that really can vary when you are looking at, it, it can vary within breeds, right? So as you can understand, it depends on the type of cattle and how you're feeding them and such. But the better genetics you have, the better your feed efficiency is. It could be four to five pounds of feed per for one pound of gain. And every group of animals that you have is it's going to vary a little bit. I can't tell you exactly what if I can't tell you exactly what the industry average would be. Have they increased feed efficiency? Yes. But once again, it's I feel like we're where we're at, where we've been maintaining, but you will get some variations, especially in breed, how they're fed and where they're fed at a location as well. You probably would be living under a rock if you're not aware that there is a significant societal push to transition us away from meat to get us to be more plant-based. Seeing real world implications of that in either your particular uh, operation or are you seeing that across the industry as well? How is the industry responding to that? Do you see any significant shifts in in the U.S. food supply or how we raise beef or or any of those types of things to, to meet sustainability goals that are being talked about? In regards to, I guess I live, I probably live in the best state for no one to really care since I'm in Nebraska. Like we just love beef and beef is everywhere. Yeah, I can, we all know that there's uh, meatless products around, but to be honest, I think people are ignoring it. And, And maybe it's because I'm in a little bit of a bubble here. I'm not that far from Omaha. I go to Omaha on a regular basis, but people still want meat. People are still buying quarter halves and holes. Business has not slowed down anywhere. I truly don't think. Now, once again, I live in the middle of the country and we really appreciate red meat. I do feel like a lot of people saw behind like this push that this is better for the environment, but I do feel like people have realized, no, it's not. When they really started looking at ingredients of the Beyond Meat BS that they were trying to share and all those terrible ingredients and stuff, I do think that consumers did wake up and realize that's not sustainable. And that doesn't make any sense, especially when you look at the nutritional value you get from three ounces of beef versus three ounces of Lord knows what's all mixed in that fake meat. But honestly, no, there hasn't been much push, I would say. And I, people are still wanting steak. No, I absolutely. I think the demand is there. I think that's uh, the consumer demand is, I think, always going to be strong. The question is, Will there be legislation or regulations or restrictions placed that make it more difficult for us to obtain that, either make it more difficult for you to produce it or for us to actually be able to afford to consume it? Do you see people are talking about carbon credits and things like that? Is that, is that something that you guys even have any kind of thought about? Or if they say, hey, we have to meet these certain carbon emission goals or carbon sequestration goals, is that a discussion that's being talked about at all? And, and I feel like sometimes as you understand with your presence on social media, like we see these articles and they spread like wildfire and I'm like, okay, what's the v- validity to it? Like how fast is this coming down the pipeline? Is it really going to happen? Or is this just one of those things that like Joe Blow brought up and has been blown up? I have not heard anything locally about that. And Nebraska Beef Council does a really good job in sharing information and, and the resources that we have. I have not heard anything. Now, I do think that unfortunately, if something like that's going to happen, I feel like they're going to try to hit feedlots or somebody first. We're the small guys, right? We're the small potatoes. The cow-calf guys, I would say, usually seem to be the last guys to feel the wrath, for lack of a better word. Dairy and and feedlots are easier to target than all your small cow-calf producers. But from a legislation standpoint and regarding carbon footprints or any sort of regulations, I have not seen nor heard anything being forced or being discussed yet. Yeah. 
Okay. I mean, it very well could be. And I know, like I said, you hear, I mean, I know in Ireland, for instance, they're, 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 they have on the proposal still, I think, to, to call 180,000 head of cattle. And I'm just, I'm just, what, what do you, what do they do with those cattle? They just throw them in a ditch somewhere and no, and they don't become utilized or what is your understanding about, or maybe you don't know anything about that. Yeah, I don't. And, and that's the thing that I feel like sometimes when we hear these things from other countries and then that's where it comes here and we're all holding our breath, but honestly, I haven't heard anything and I'm not saying that it's not being discussed, but it's realistically, they have these thought processes in 93% of the farms and ranches in Nebraska are family owned. When they make these like bold claims of maybe implying some of these rules, it's like, how would you even go about enforcing it? First off, I know it scares people and I, I still think it's something to watch. I really don't understand that. But in regards to Ireland, I don't know why you would cull the cows. I don't know what your what their thought process is with that, because even some of the bigger butchers in the United States couldn't, that'd be shutting down and, and just getting rid of a bunch of cows. I don't understand the logic, the thought process, or what they would be doing with that. And in regards to trying to dispose of that, they're saying it's for a good cause, right? Think of how much carbon and waste they're wasting and getting rid of those cows, hauling them, remo- removing them. And then what are they going to replace what those cows are producing with? As you and I both know, meatless meat's not going to solve anything. And you're actually going to have a worse carbon footprint once you would get rid of those cows. I don't understand the logic or how or why. Yeah, I think the ultimate, even if they did that, and it's still debatable what they will, but they're certainly talking pretty hard about that. Those cows will just be produced in Brazil or somewhere else where probably they have even less regard for for climate outcomes. And it is concerning to say the least. As far as when you guys are, because you said you're you said you're a smaller cow calf type of thing with, yeah. with the breeding program. And, and, I, and when I say small cow calf is all the cattle in the feedlots that everybody gets, your beef from the grocery store, all those cattle in the feedlots all start at small cow-calf operations right. like us. There isn't these big, large cow-calf operations. Yeah, there's a few, but I think the average cow herd size is either 50 or 100 cows in the United States. So just to put that into perspective, that's what's feeding America. Yeah, they may end up in a feedlot for a little bit but it's still coming from ranchers like us. Yeah, my understanding is like 98% of, of the ranches are... are like you said, 40, 50 head of cattle, small cow calf. There's, unfortunately, I think back in the 70s, there was like 1.3 or 4 million of them, and now it's down to 700,000. So we've lost a significant number of those over the years, yeah. which is a concern. Do you probably, other ranchers that have shuttered their doors or closed up shop or sold or went out of business, is that a real concern for your operation, or do you guys feel like you're in a pretty good position? It is a concern. Uh, We've lost a little bit of farm ground. We're not big farmers in regards to um, crop production. It helps your business, obviously, if you can do some. And we're getting, you know, land prices around here are severely inflated because there's a lot of people that, especially since COVID, have been looking at buying land as a investment, right? People who are just buying some land because they have money to invest. So they're inflating the price of crop ground. It's not the actual cost that it should be. So yeah, it's still a concern. I think it's a concern for everybody. I don't know any farmer or rancher, especially rancher cow calf production that never, you know, we sold it now because land prices are so inflated. It's a huge concern. The average age of your American rancher, I think is either 60 or 65. My dad's 63. What you're, we're losing our older generation of ranchers. And if they don't have somebody to come in and to take that over, it's going to be gone. And who's going to buy it is Bill Gates is one of the largest landowners now in the state of Nebraska. People don't understand how hard truly ranching is. And then when you're retiring and you're getting older, if that next generation doesn't come in, just some larger corporation is going to come in, buy it up. And people don't know that it's Bill Gates buying it. It's not that they're selling it to him. It's these big businesses coming in, hiding behind a name, and they're just gobbling up these small ranches when they decide to retire. Yeah. Speaking of that, with Bill Gates, you said he's one of the largest landowners in Nebraska, or maybe the largest landowner. What is he doing with that land? Do we know what he's doing with the land? It's all monocrop agriculture. And I'm not a basher when it comes to ag production. Um, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. That's a different discussion, but he's buying up crop ground. So he's buying corn primarily in the state of Nebraska where the corn huskers, right? It's primarily corn, soybeans, maybe a little bit of wheat or what our crop ground is being 
utilized for. He's buying that ground. So what is he obviously using that for? He's buying that ground because he is invested in fake meat. What's fake meat made out of? It is made out of soybeans. So there's a reason why he's doing this. It's clear as day, but unfortunately, it's still happening. Yeah. And so he's not buying a pasture land that that you would otherwise run cattle on. So he's just buying- He may be buying some, but it's primarily crop ground from my understanding. Okay. And let me just, because this gets into, and again, I'm not a rancher. I'm not directly involved in this, but I, I tangentially experience some of this stuff. How do you, with that being known and knowing that people would like to convert people over to fake meat and stuff like that, how good of a job is the beef industry doing to push back against that? There's an, obviously there's a beef checkoff program, which has mm-hmm. part of NCBA, which has something called the Beef Promotions Operations Committee, whose job is supposed to spend $30, $40 million a year in promoting beef. Are, are you, do you feel like they represent you well as a producer? Or I know there's some pushback saying that maybe they're more on the Packers side. What are your thoughts on how beef is being promoted in the United States? The Nebraska Beef Council does a great job, first and foremost. So that's my state council. I have a working relationship with them. They bust their butts. They have ranchers like us who sell direct on their website. Like they're trying, they really are trying. So from a local level, I feel like, because that's still a subdivision of the beef checkoff has done a good job. When it comes to the national level, I can't remember if I was in college. I remember hearing Matthew McConaughey on the radio and he was doing an ad for the national, like the NCBA, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. I was like, finally, because that's social media was taking off. And I was like, man, I hope they do some more promotions. It's a little, I find it ironic. Like I see advertisements from the National Cattlemen's Beef Association in ag magazines. And I'm like, you're targeting the wrong people, right? Everybody in ag knows beef's good. We all can go get a steak easily. I do feel like there should be a little bit more in regards to just beef production and misinformation and sharing that. And especially as social media can be such a tool, I have seen a little bit where they've tried to get some like influencer type people in to show and do that stuff. But in regards to spreading the word, when the whole mRNA vaccine hoopla came out, everybody was worried about that in livestock. I was impressed with how they handled that. But I feel like there's always room for improvement is what I'm saying. I feel like some more can be done um, to keep spreading, like you said, especially in your highly populated areas of the country that don't have access to this information. Yeah, I think it's a shame that the average American does not understand what the greenhouse gas footprint of beef is in this country, and that it's 2% of our output rather than what most people will quote is 20%, 50%, 20%, 50%, they don't yep. know. And I think that's a failing of NCBA and others in the beef checkoff that the average American doesn't know that. Let me just, because you mentioned something a lot of people ask me about all the time, is mRNA vaccines and cattle. What is your understanding of the status of that? Is it something we're going to be dealing with in, in the near future? My understanding is it's not happening in the U.S., not yet. But what are your thoughts or do you have any concerns around that? My previous job, I do have some contacts in that realm. And my understanding is nothing's happening. Sometimes I wonder if, as in regards to research, like maybe one time they were looking at it in a research type setting and it it got taken and ran with. I have no concern right now. I am literally buying vaccine for our cattle and administering it. If there was anything available, we would be seeing it. It's not happening. I'm not concerned in any way, shape or form. Another thing that a lot of consumers were concerned with is when they heard coronavirus as every coronavirus is everywhere. So that was another concern when people saw we were vaccinating for that. We have been for years because that's something that ranchers need to prevent against, but it's nothing in relation to what we have. I'm not concerned, never say never, but also The amount of research that goes into animal production is just as much as, or animal production in animal medicine and vaccines is just as much or more that's done in humans. I'm never going to say never, but that's not a concern right now. Yeah, fair enough. And and like I said, that's the same sort of thought. I I said, I, I don't think it's a big issue right now and may never be, but I guess we'll just have to keep our ears open. So as far as the, because I have a very vested interest in the beef industry being successful. I, this is the company that I have is based on people having access to high quality meat, just 
because it helps with, it literally helps them get rid of diseases in many cases, which I think most people, and this is another frustration I'll share with you. I, we, through U.S. Cattlemen's Association, recently pr- uh, approached NCBA, B- BPOC, the Beef Promotions uh, uh, Organization Committee, about funding, and they fund every year, it's to the tune of about 30, 40, 40 million dollars worth of projects to promote beef. And they have funded a lot of research projects, and we were trying to get them to do a study on diabetes. And we got a, a very a great team of researchers that were that you know, published hundreds and hundreds of studies. They're a well respected team. And they said, We don't think it's in our interest to promote beef based diet. And I'm like, Are you kidding me? This doesn't make sense. Your whole rationale is to promote beef. Why wouldn't you do a study that shows that beef can basically reverse diabetes, which I know it can. So I'm shocked that has happened and hopefully we'll get that study funded in one way or another. But maybe we'll talk to the state councils if they're more perhaps, because it's not that much money. It's a, it's some, but it's not ridiculous. And they certainly could have afforded it, but I'm not sure what's, I think maybe they fall into the guise of the USDA and the USDA is somewhat captured in a way, in my view, <laughs> that may have something to do with that. But what, because you mentioned your father, as you said, 63 and the average rancher is like you, you quoted early mid sixties, something like that. And so a lot of these guys are going to retire. And, and do you think, is your plan personally to step in or you have some other siblings or somebody that's going to take over the business and just keep it going? Is that what's going on in your particular business? Yeah. I'm my dad's son. He just didn't get a son. I'm like, sorry, dad, this is what you got. He had two daughters. So (laughs) it is what it is. Yes. I help my dad. I have two toddlers as well. They're five and seven. My one son now can, he's seven and he's 93 pounds of muscle. So he's going to be taking my place here in a minute, but we're completely family. I help a lot. My husband helps as well. I rake hay, bale hay. I calve with my dad. I do everything he can do, just maybe not in, he's a strong man as well. Do it to the best of my ability and work alongside of him. That is like a concern, like you said. And a lot of people also don't realize there's really not that much profit in beef production. There's years where I can't remember, I think it was around COVID or maybe the year after And there was a rancher in Montana and it reminded me of my dad. And he goes, I'm feeding America and I'm growing broke doing it. And it is so disheartening the years where you take, there's sometimes years where ranchers take their calf crop to the sale barn. They're lucky if they make 50 bucks a head. And that's supposed to be their living wage for the entire year. So when you say just for example, like you're trying to prove how important beef is and to diabetes and to the public. Like we need those studies to keep showing people beef's not the problem. It's the bun. So that is a concern. And there's days where I think we're making headway. And there's days where I just can't believe that people are trying to have people push crickets. So that's my plan is to take over this and and, and to keep going. But we need people like you to keep sharing the good word, because I do feel like sometimes people don't want to hear it from the mouth of the person raising it. It's a different, it hits different when it's from a health professional like yourself. Yeah. And I'm happy to do that. And I think there has to be a symbiotic relationship between if food is medicine, you need food. (laughs) So you need somebody to produce that. So it's nice that we've been, we, over the last few years, I've been particularly sensitive to, to, supporting ranchers and talking about them and getting their input and learning about what you guys do because it's so critical to our health really infrastructure what you guys are doing is part of the health infrastructure whether we want to admit it or not what are your thoughts on these guys like thomas massey who's he's obviously a u.s congressman he's also a cattle rancher himself i think i understand he is and he's pushing something called the prime act which he's been talking about for 10 years he still hasn't got it passed but are is there any legislation that you see on the books that either you think it's a good idea or a bad idea. I know, for instance, in Oregon, they've got this proposal initiative 13, where they want to basically outlaw animal agriculture, which is crazy. They want to make AI considered sexual assault on animals. This is what they're, these crazy people are talking about, outlawing hunting and fishing and that on that end is the weird stuff. But what about the good stuff? Is there, is, are there some things that you think are going to, are going to get like taken care of. I knew during the pandemic, we had a big bottleneck at the processing facilities. We couldn't, they're filled up. And as you probably know, you better have your appointment two years in advance, probably yep. something like that. So where do you, what do you think can be done or what's being done or what are you hopeful about? 
The one thing like in regards to what you were saying, so I, once again, Nebraska and our funding has done a really great job. So there's actually a couple larger processing plants going up. My dad actually went and toured one and I can't re- it's within an hour and a half of us. And what they're going to do is they're in between your small packer and your big packer in daily volume. And I'm sorry, I can't remember what the daily volume will be. But they are going to, they're taking the big fours business, trying to compete. More grocery stores are trying to carry local produce as well as meat. There's a lot of local grocery chains now that are buying eggs from egg producers. I can find cheese from a dairy in our area. I can find whole milk from that dairy in our area. And I'm talking, I'm in Omaha at a large grocery store chain. So I am hopeful. I think actually there may be two or three processing facilities within three hours of me that are going to be that middle guy between your small mom and pop places to your big four butcher plants that are going to have that volume where they're cutting into that market. And their goal is to sell Nebraska beef. So if you're a rancher in Nebraska, you can take your beef there. And I think they're going to pay you a premium. And then they're going to market your beef at uh, no, no, I, I get it. Yeah, you got you, you froze up for a second and disappeared. I don't know what you're like. I'm on Starlink. I'm in the rural area as well. And so <laughs> sometimes we lose. Sorry. That, but I mean, we were talking about, I guess, some of the different proposals out there that are being, you know, Thomas Massey's Prime Act. And there's some other ones. I think there's a, oh, I can't remember. Another guy named Mike Calicrate, who I think is, I think he's maybe Kansas. I think he might be in Kansas or Missouri. He's, he always talks about the enforcing the Stockers and Packyard Act in 1921 with, with some of that stuff. It's on, it's on the books, but it's not being enforced. Yeah. There's, I guess I saw something about it. There's a, there's a, I don't know if it's been passed or it was proposed to be passed, something like the 3030 law, where it was something about reclaiming 30% of state land and, and turning it over to the national park system or something like that. And I think Nebraska would be a state that would be disproportionately impacted because I think, as you mentioned, the, almost the entire state of Nebraska is covered with agricultural land. Is that correct? Yeah. You have the sand hills and when you get out in that area, but when you look at it from like a national park standpoint and government land, for lack of a better word, but you know where I'm going with that. We don't really have much where we're not like South Dakota, where you have Custer state park and all those things. We just don't really have that, that much government land. Now I would be interested to see what CRP, how much CRP is in effect or not, but you know, with the big ethanol boom that happened, gosh, however many years ago, a lot's been switched over to production. CRP. I'm not familiar with that particular acronym. Um, It's the conservation research program. I think that's the correct word. So what you do is you can enroll land to be in CRP and it's basically just left like prairie. You can't harvest it. It's grassland that you sign up for 10 years. The government gives you a very small payment. It's basically just keeping it native is what the purpose of that is. We, as you mentioned, beef demand is still high. I think it sells it. I think for years, they didn't put much investment in marketing beef because it wanted to taste so good and it speaks for itself. I remember like beef, it's what's for dinner was, I think was released in like 1992 and they haven't really yeah. done much since that time. Was, what was it? Sam Elliott voicing that back in the day. Yeah. But is we have, and I think demand is growing certainly international. And we see it as some of these developing countries are becoming more affluent beef demand goes up. China is required asking for more beef. Their numbers have gone up significantly over the last several years. Are you seeing the demand generally going up or do you think it's flat? If you look at the stats back in 1977, I think, or around that 78, maybe beef consumption in the United States was an all time high. We used to eat about 95 pounds of beef a year. That number is now down to around 56 pounds of beef a year. So many people don't understand the average American is only eating a little over two ounces of beef a day, which is in, in my view, yeah, that wouldn't even be enough to get me out of bed. I'm not even going to bother unless it's a pound for me. That's this kind of thing. But are you seeing are you seeing a real world effect of demand co- increasing? And do you see more demand for direct to consumer box beef type of stuff? Is that something you're seeing more of? I think the demand is there more now. Where you and I people are like, how much red meat do you eat? And I'm like, I don't know the last day I didn't eat red meat. There's this you and I are we're we are blessed with freezers, right? We got those chest freezers full of beef. I do think that the demand has gone up, but not in the way that you and I would like. Maybe the demands got up, and people are like, oh, I can have a couple steaks a week, or I can have a burger and a steak. But I don't think we're quite there yet where people realize, no, you can have red meat every day. 
do you see what I'm saying? Like where was that dip, right? Where the heart association, I don't know what year that came out with red meets the enemy and you're going to have a heart attack and die if you eat it. And I feel like we're slowly climbing out of that hole, but I don't think that it's at the point where people truly feel comfortable in eating red meat every day or feel confident in cooking red meat every day. We're close. I just don't think it's there yet because I have a lot of people that buy beef from me and they're like, I don't know how to cook this cut. And I'm like, it's a roast. Like a crock pot is your best friend. And so that I'm still floored by how many people, and I'm not making fun of them. It's just something that I've taken for granted. Like these are the basic cuts. And I think it's this learning curve of getting people back into it. Yeah, for sure. You'd mentioned we're, we're certainly not at a place where, where every American's eating red meat every day. Do you think we could even get there? Do you think we have the resources? Like I said, 1977, 130 million head of cattle. 2023, 92 million head of cattle. We had 40 million head of cattle more than we do now. And some people would say that we could improve stocking rates depending upon how we and let me get into that. Let me get into that. Your thoughts on AMP grazing, adaptive multi grazing, holistic grazing, regenerative, mat, whatever you want to call it. There's lots of ways people call that. What are your thoughts on that? And do you think we can scale up significantly our beef production in the United States? First, we're feeding more people with less cattle. So that goes into the efficiency you were talking about. Right. I will give a nod to that. Ranchers are getting better and better with the number game. And when I'm saying the number gain, I'm talking about paying attention to your average daily gain. We have the resources now to calculate to make sure we're breeding for those things to be efficient. So that is one thing we have become more efficient. If you look at cattle that were around in 1960 versus now, like it, the cattle look a lot different not in a bad way. I'm just saying we've become more efficient. One thing I will say, I have said before that we use regenerative and sustainable practices. Everybody does. It depends on your extreme, right? You have people like white oak pastures who are more, and I'm not saying extreme in a bad way. I'm saying way more in depth in how they're utilizing that. For example, we haul manure our onto pastures right now that was by our windbreaks and stuff from the winter. That's regenerative and sustainable, right? We're not using synthetic fertilizer. We're using manure and bedding. That was by our windbreaks in the winter where we bed our cows because it's cold and snowy. We push that up, you stockpile it, you wait and you spread it. So some of those terms, like we've been doing that forever. I do feel like there can be more done, but here's the problem. Where I live, there's not much pasture left because everything's getting bought up. When land goes for sale, if a cattleman doesn't buy it, a farmer's buying it, rips it up and puts it into crop and soybean production. Why are they putting into crop production? Because of all the ethanol plants in our area. It's not an easy fix. Some of these regenerative, like you said, more intense grazing. And when I say intense, I'm talking about maybe some more intense rotational grazing and doing some of these things. We also have to have the land for it. We're not making more dirt. Could we be better with some things? Of course, but also you're stuck with what you've got. So how are you going to maybe put some more of these practices into place when you're surrounded by corn. I don't know. Yeah. There's, I don't know. I, I guess there's things like cover crops and things like that. I get, yep. I'm not, like I said, an expert in any sense. I've learned a lot over there, a lot more than I knew five years ago for sure. But in, let they me ask are, you. Yeah, they are, I will say though, like we do plant rye. We planted rye as a cover crop this year and we are doing some more cover crops. And for example, we graze our cows on corn stalks with the severe drought we are in right now. We're harvesting, we already did silage. I'm hoping in the next few weeks, maybe, which we need rain, but we're probably not going to get it. We'll get cows on corn stalks sooner. Some of those practices, of course, we are doing. We put cows on stalks and then we trail them home. They follow us home when we're done. We are doing some of those practices, I will say. And I have seen more of a push for cover crops in our local publications. They are pushing for more cover crops. Yeah. One thing, and not to knock anyone, of course, I'm anybody that's raising meat, I'm like, good for you. Cause then I ain't got to do it. And it's hard work. And I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to do it. And I'm always thankful for anybody that's willing to feed me. You get guys like Will Harris, who might be critical of what you're doing. He might say, Hey, look, you're doing something that is not good for the environment It's bad. It's making the animal sick. How does that because most farmers or ranchers and stuff are probably doing something similar to what you're doing. How does that play in, in, in your particular audience? When another rancher is saying, I'm doing it, the thing that's the best way and what you're doing is, is not only not good, but actually bad. How does that play? And, and I, I feel like this is where you and I are, are very similar. Like 
ranching is different. Ranching is different in every location. I live in Nebraska. We don't have a growing season year round. He does. He's in Georgia, right? So he's got longer growing season with his grass and his forage. Um, he's able to maybe have some more animals free range where he rotates different types of animals. I know he has hogs. I don't know if he has sheep, for example, but there's no slaughterhouses for sheep. So say I wanted to do sheep locally, I don't have a sale barn to market those sheep. There's different things to take into consideration as every location. And yeah, there's always something everybody can be doing better, but I always share like, this is what we do and why we do it. You got to do what works for you. No rancher is trying to ruin the environment. No rancher wants to leave their pasture in worse shape after their cattle have grazed. Like we want to continue doing what we're doing. So I don't feel that sometimes the worst critics are the people within your business where we are all just trying to do the best we can and better ourselves. Yeah, I guess one, one question I would have for you is a fellow named Gabe Brown, who also is promoting this sort of regenerative grazing style. He's in North Dakota. So how does he do that up there in North Dakota, which is obviously colder than Nebraska? In, in some, some locations too. So he may have enough pasture where he doesn't graze it and can graze it more in the winter because there is cool season grass that will grow. But my question would be with some of those who do try to graze year round. I mean, if you get snow and then as you know, if snow melts a little bit, cows can't push through the snow with their nose, you're going to have to supplement with feed at some point. So he may be trying to graze year round, but I, there are some of my friends up in North Dakota, like they had a lot of snow this year. You're not grazing. In, in the winter. Once that snow gets there, cattle can't really dig through three feet of snow with their nose to try and graze. So maybe he's able to do some more intense grazing. Maybe he's able to try to save some pasture to turn cows out in earlier in the spring if the snow melts. But I would be interested to see that as well, from what I understand some from some of my friends in the area who ranch as well. Yeah. And I think but bison may be more I think bison are a little hardier and they can dig down a little bit better than they're not going to dig down through six feet of snow, obviously, but they can get through some of that. Um, yep. At what point for the vegans that are listening to this, what days of the week do you actually torture the animals? Because I, I know that's oh, what you, I'm usually, told you do that. Yeah. Yes. Do you have a schedule it's for the torture? With why. <laughs> <laughs> I shared a post. It was a year ago. We had the veterinarian out. He was, I can't remember what we were doing. We might've been doing breeding soundness exam on our sale bowl. So the Vet comes out and literally does a physical, basically. And we had a first calf heifer. So she hadn't had a calf yet, ever. And we brought her into the barn. It was a cold and the wind was blowing and we were helping the vet. And we just wanted her close so we could keep an eye on her. And I'm at the shoot with my dad and he goes, run in and check on that heifer. And I said, I will after I get this next group of calves in. Just trying to keep everything moving. I went in the shed. And she had given birth and the uh, placenta was still over the calf's head. And I yelled for my dad and I went in there, got her up. What's supposed to happen is right when the calf hits the ground, the cow usually jumps up, turns around and starts cleaning them off. He did not. That calf basically suffocated. I hollered at my dad to come in. He removes the placenta off the calf's head and proceeds to try to administer CPR. My dad was a fireman for 25 years in Omaha while still ranching, did a couple puffs of air and he gets gone. I was so mad and I just would love sometime. I've seen my dad do that multiple times. How many people do you know will do that? That's just one day that we tried everything we could do they're going to argue you shouldn't have had that calf in there and even have beef cattle. But the lengths we went to that day to try to make sure that calf was born in a, cool, a comfortable location and everything went well and it still didn't go well. And I see my dad try to do CPR for a minute. They just don't understand the lengths that we go to to try to do the best that we can. Yeah, I, I you know clearly I, I I know that. I know you guys care tremendously <laughs> about the animals. It does you no good to have sick, angry, stressed out animals. It, 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 there's no... There's literally no benefit for that. And so we have this sort of misinformation. What, how, because there's a lot of people, like you said, there's a lot of city, city slickers, right? I mean, these people, yeah. they live, they grow up in the city. They live in the city. They've never seen, they think food comes from the grocery store. They don't, they've never seen agriculture for crop agriculture or animal agriculture. What can be done to, to what would you tell these people that are, that are like, they, they have these sort of misconceptions about animal agriculture or agriculture in general? What is there an overall message that you would share or, to tell, or what should they do to educate themselves if they care to do? Many of them don't. 
if they would care to do, I think following any sort of rancher online and especially as there are some that are a little more honest than others, I would like to say that I'm a little more upfront, not in a bad way, but it just, I have so many people message me. They're like, I didn't realize it took this much work. And that's, I think that's one of the things is because I feel like it's this assumption that we're just money hungry people who don't care. I don't think they realize the amount of of time and effort that goes into raising cattle. That steak on your plate didn't just take 18 months to get there from birth. It also took one whole year of breeding and being in that like gestation. It takes three years to get a good steak. And I I think a lot of consumers just don't realize that the time and effort and we really care. I can't tell you how many of my ranching friends call me at 11 o'clock at night or four in the morning because they're waiting on something. It's just this constant, we care so much. We care too much, I think, is you could almost say, we care more than you think. Yeah, no, I have no doubt about it. You've you got to love what you do to be up there at two o'clock in the morning in the middle of a, a snowstorm out there taking care of animals. You don't, you don't get a day off. They don't take vacations. No. And so rarely do, you, rarely do people that have them, that's you know, very hard to leave, I, I would imagine. Um as far as you said, you're on social media, which I'm so glad to see more ranchers doing that because I think, and it's tough because you're so darn busy. You just don't have, it's not something like a lot of people have time. And I've seen, I interviewed a couple gals, Tara Van Dusen and Natalie Kavor, Kavorsek, I think. Yep. They have like Understanding Ag podcast and I talked to them a month or two ago and we got more and more folks that are getting out there doing that. Are you... Why are you doing social media? Are you enjoying it? And are you getting good, bad? You're getting a lot of negative feedback from the sort of the do-gooding vegan sort of activist folks or how has that been going for you? I just shared the honest stuff. I just shared a reel like the other day I took off and just showed us feeding hay on pasture because we're in a drought and it's miserable. And I'm like, this isn't pretty. We've got a drought. There's hoses everywhere because we're having water tanks everywhere because our ponds and creeks are drying up. And I just shared the honest stuff. I'm not the shock and awe. I'm just trying to share the honest. I I wasn't a social media sharer really before I started my business, but I just wanted people to know who I was and what we're really trying to do. It's hard a lot of days. And when I say I don't share the shock and awe, so sometimes I don't get as many crazies. They're still there. And most of the time people are telling me they want, they just awful things that I don't even want to repeat. But I just wanted people to feel like, and not even if they buy beef from me, I on, I share a lot of the times like your beef in the grocery stores, raised in ranchers from ranches like us. And if you want to find beef, look here and here. I just like you, I'm trying to share the goodness of beef for, beef for yourself and your family and how America is trying to raise your beef. Because I do fear that if people don't get behind and continue to support beef, there could be a problem where we don't have as much as we would like. And then, like you said, it's going to be coming from New Zealand and Australia and Brazil and other places. So I just want people to feel comfortable and buy beef and have it be American made. Very good. And so your social media on Instagram, you are D and D beast, Delta and Delta beef. Uh, I've been following yep. you for a long time, I know. And I thank you for coming on and sharing your story and being an advocate for this, because I think hopefully more ranchers will continue to get the message out there because I think it's been very one-sided and lopsided propaganda the wrong way. And I think we need to basically level the playing field a little bit. So thank you so much, Michaela, for doing that. Any last minute things you want to say before we go? I just want to thank you so much. I've been a fan of yours forever. I think I met you at Keto Summit, one of the first ones in Omaha. And I just appreciate you having me on here and just want to say thank you so much for everything you're doing as well. Awesome. Thank you. The rest of the folks, thanks everybody. We'll be back tomorrow. Thanks thanks again, Michaela. Bye-bye, guys. Thank you.